the book of 3 John. 3 John is our launching uh, scripture together. I started a series last week. We'll be looking at the issue of kingdom prosperity and uh, looking uh, biblically at that idea of prosperity. I gave a definition last week, and that is prosperity is a growing or a thriving condition, especially in your finances. And so this series we're looking at, uh, is prosperity good? Is it God's will? And if so, how do we achieve financial prosperity? So we laid that foundation last week and just kind of began giving understanding and the clear idea that God does want you to prosper in the area of finances. So then we now come to today and the next few weeks, and that is we have to answer a major question before we get to how to prosper. We have to answer the question, why? Why don't people prosper? And so we're going to look uh, for the next few weeks. We're going to look at spiritual reasons why people don't prosper We're going to look at mental or ways of thinking, mental reasons, and then we're going to look at practical reasons. Once we answer those questions, then we can get into some uh, very practical and spiritual ways that you can prosper. So we have to begin, this is today's lesson, uh, we have to begin with this idea Poverty, according to the Bible, is a curse. Poverty is a supernatural dimension. And that is where we are going to uh, uh, begin. And so today's lesson is breaking the curse of poverty. Third John, verse 2. Our reader is going to read that, our main verse. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Okay, this is the will of God plainly stated. The Apostle John says, I'm praying for you that you may prosper. And so that's, we're using that as a launching uh, verse. Breaking the curse of poverty is today's lesson. Let's begin with this thought, poverty is spiritual. If uh, prosperity is a growing or thriving condition, the opposite of prosperity would, of course, be poverty. By definition, in a dictionary, poverty is deficiency, impoverishment, or, in other words, not having enough. And we're talking about money, not having enough money or not having enough resources. So what poverty does, if you don't have enough, poverty makes you unable. You are not able. Poverty is an inability in life and, of course, especially in finances. And so if you are struggling with poverty, there are two kinds of insufficiency that are at work in your life. And the first is what we would call inward Uh, insufficiency, in other words, how does it affect you? What are you unable to do if you're living in poverty? You are, of course, unable to pay bills. You are unable to meet your needs, whatever that is, education, transportation, uh, medical, whatever it might be. You can't meet your own needs. You are unable to relieve the financial stress in your life, which is what we looked at last week, is finances, um, perhaps almost more than anything else in life, cause stress. So people in poverty, they can't make that stress go away. And then, of course, uh, the, one of the things that you're unable to do in poverty is you are unable to get ahead let me just throw this out. Some of you, it is, you don't have enough at all. Others of you, it is paycheck to paycheck. You barely are squeaking by. That's not a fun way to live. Is that, is that true? 
Some of you, it's like you're not, you're not in the poorhouse. They're not repossessing your children yet, but you are hanging on by your fingernails. That's poverty. That is not enough. We see some examples in the Bible. 1 Kings 17, 12. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar, and see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. All right, this is a, a real woman. The Old Testament, the widow of Zarephath, as she's commonly called, this lady who lives in the place called Zarephath. She says, this is my life. In those days, no such thing as uh, social security. There was no social safety nets, no programs uh, in the nation that she was living. And she said, I do not have enough. This is it. We have enough for one meal. Me and my son are going to eat, and then we're going to die because there are no options. 2 Kings 4, verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. All right, now this is debt. This is why debt is a curse. If you willingly get yourself into debt, why would you want to do that? Because you don't find happy creditors in the Bible. Uh, uh, you are, are people that uh, owe uh, money. And so she says here, and I want you to point, notice this, poverty affects children, right? In both stories that we just read, it's not just you, your kids pay. Your kids pay because there's not enough for basic needs. Your kids pay, as we looked in the series on rejection, if you grow up in poverty, it marks you in certain ways that affects you long after even the poverty is uh, uh, finished. So inward insufficiency, it affects you. Then there is outward insufficiency. If you are living in poverty, if you don't have enough, God gives you money. It is meant, and we're going to look at this a later lesson, the principle of money is the principle of flow. It is, you are not meant to be a repository of finances. It's supposed to flow. And you learn this is actually how life and money works best. If you don't have enough, of course, one of the simple problems is you then are unable to bless God. I predict that there would have been people in our conference just a few weeks ago that were stirred perhaps on Thursday night by planting in a new nation, touching India. They were stirred. They would have liked to have given more or given at all, but the reality is they're living in poverty they cannot release. And we uh, just mentioned very briefly last week, God does not give you money just for you. When he puts money in your hands, it is part of God's will. Not only should you honor God, bless the work of God, but you should also uh, be blessing and helping other people. If you don't have enough, obviously you can't uh, pass it on. So this is what we call poverty. It's insufficient. All right, now, this is what we're going to focus on, however. You can relate why do people live in poverty because the unfair oppression and inequities of the... I, I get all that. Biblically, however... Poverty is supernatural, and you must get there. This is one of the most important lessons that we're going to learn about money. Poverty is supernatural. It is a spiritual force. If you simply look at, yes, I am in poverty because I lacked the opportunities that Wealthier people, people in Scottsdale, they, of course, can afford to send their kids to the nicest university, blah, blah, blah. If you view it simply as 
education if you view your financial situation and poverty simply as luck, you're never going to prosper. Because all of those opportunities are true, education may be true, luck is not true, but if that's how you view life, I promise you 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you are still going to be in poverty because that is not a sufficient answer. The Bible uses a word that is connected to finances, and that word is curse. Very important Bible word is the word curse. Look at Malachi 3, verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. The book of Malachi, God is speaking to the nation of Israel, and he says here, and he immediately after this, we'll look in some other later verses, he's connecting it to their finances. He says, you are cursed with a curse. I travel all over. All over the world, I have people who ask me an honest question. Do you think it's possible that people can be cursed, that families can be cursed? Biblically, absolutely. God tells them, you're cursed. How do we know? Because then he talks about their finances. It is affecting your finances. That is what a curse does. The word curse means to bind with a spell or to make powerless. Remember what I just began? If you are in poverty, you are unable, you are powerless. That's what the word curse means. You are powerless to change or powerless to resist. The easiest way, I, I give you biblical definitions, but the easiest way to get in your head, what is a curse? A curse simply means open door. A person who is cursed, it simply means somewhere in their life a door was opened that allowed entrance to demonic spiritual powers. Demonic spiritual powers gained access to people's lives and one of the ways, this is not a, an entire treatise on, on uh, all the powers of a curse, but when, when there is something supernatural and evil at work in your life, it is going to affect your finances. That is one of the easiest way that you can see if a curse is at work. So how do we tell? What does a curse produce in a curse of poverty? And the first of these is this, negative situations that eat up or rob our finances. Think about that. If you are cursed with a curse of poverty, what you're going to find, the normal pattern of your life is negative things will happen. What is the practical effect? It's not just I had a bad day. Again and again, your finances get eaten up and robbed so that you can never get ahead. Malachi 3.11, and I'm deliberately having this read in the New Century Version. I will stop the insects. They won't eat your crops. The grapes won't fall from your vines before they are ready to pick, says the Lord All-Powerful. Okay, Malachi 3, 9 that we read before, you're cursed with a curse. These are farming people. Their, their money was crops. It was produce. They were growing grapes. They're growing grain, corn, whatever it might be. So he says, how do we know we're cursed? Because you plant... For, this would be like you're a farmer. It's like, man, every time I plant the crops, it's growing up. I'm just about to reap. Insects come and eat it up. The crops are growing on the tree. We're just about to harvest. We're just about to pick. And it's like they fall, whether that's from a storm or from uh, uh, some kind of disease or bugs or whatever. So the end result for farming people is... If that keeps happening, you can never get ahead. 
Okay, most of you are not farmers, but you can relate to that, right? I'm just about to get ahead. I got a few dollars in the bank. The refrigerator broke. The transmission fell out of the car. I had to take the kids to the hospital again and again and again. It's not farming, but you can relate to that. Negative situations repeatedly happen that always, now I'm back in the hole. Now my savings were eaten up. I am, that's a curse. Judges 6, 3 through 6. Whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other peoples from the east would come and attack them. They com camped in the land and destroyed the crops that the Israelites had planted as far away as Gaza. They left nothing for Israel to eat and no sheep, cattle, or donkeys. The Midianites came in their tents, or with their tents and their animals like swarms of locusts to ruin the land. There was so many people and camels they could not be counted. Israel became very poor because of the Midianites, so they cried out to the Lord. Okay, remember a lesson that I've taught you repeatedly. The, the Old Testament is filled with history, real people, real situations. Things that you read in the Old Testament that are physical are spiritual in the news. So here's the principle. This is what would happen. So God's people would plant crops, right? It's growing, it's growing. It's like, man, this is going to taste good. This is going to help. We're going to sell. We're going to get ahead. We're going to pay bills. We're going to do that. And right when it's almost time to harvest, the enemy shows up. And what does the enemy do? It doesn't say the enemy came and beat them all up and they were all very sore. That's not what it says. What did the enemy do? He targeted their crops in those days were money. Targeted their money. And this happened for six years. Part of this, this is why I know it's demonic, is that, you know, you can have bad things happen anytime, but some of you know what this is like. Some of you, it's like, Wow, I got ahead a little bit. I have a few bucks in the bank. And that's when it all goes to hell in your life. So it's actually more discouraging, isn't it? It's like I was this close to getting ahead. And then the boss said they're shutting the company down. Or fill in the blank, a hundred different ways. The end result, that is talking about and God even speaks about it. They were cursed. This is why it was happening. It wasn't luck. It was a curse. Job 1, 14 and through 17. A messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were eating grass nearby when the Sabaeans attacked and carried them away. They killed the servants with swords and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. The messenger was still speaking when another messenger arrived and said, Lightning from God fell from the sky, burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. The second messenger was still speaking when another messenger arrived and said, The Babylonians sent three groups of attackers and swept down and stole your camels and killed the servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Okay. Some of you, have you ever had a day like this? <laughs> <laughs> it starts out and it just keeps going downhill. But n notice how many of these things are financial, right? We, the oxen are plowing, donkey, that's, that's your assets, that's your, that's your money. Enemies came and attacked, and what did they do? They took away your assets, your money. I'm the only one who escaped. And while the messenger was still speaking, you just read the email from hell and the phone rings. <laughs> Hello? Lightning burned up the sheep. Again, that was assets. That's your money. And while he was still speaking, there was a knock at the door. <laughs> You're reading the email from hell. You're on the phone call from hell. You open the door and the Babylonians came. And what did they do? They stole your money. But we know, you read at the beginning of the chapter, this was all from hell. 
That's what you have to understand. It is more than luck. It's not luck at all. It's supernatural. And some of you can relate to this. It's sickness that costs money. It's sickness that keeps you from working. Things break repeatedly. Some people have moving cycles of financial disaster. It's the car, it's the house, it's the kids, it's the health, it's the car, it's the house, it's the kids, it's the... It just goes round and round and round and round again. Problem with jobs, business, and I could tell many, many different stories. So here's my question. How many bad things have to happen to you financially before you finally think, this is from hell. Because I've talked to people. I, I have been with people. I, I've seen it in their life. It's like, yeah. come on. How many, I've talked to people. It's like, do you realize in the last two weeks, you had two car crashes, 10 of the electronic devices in your house blew up and are not working. And this wasn't from lightning. How many? Does it take 11? Does it take 15? Does it take five car? Come on. At what point do you go, this is from hell? Either you are the unluckiest person in the world, or this is demonic, because that is not normal. For some of you, the unfortunate part is poverty has become normal. You're used to this. It's, it's, you're like Wile E. Coyote. You're, you're, you're waiting for the anvil to fall. Every time you get something good, it's like, this, this can't last. What's going to happen wrong? Because that's become normal. That is not normal. It is from hell. And so a curse of poverty eats up or robs your finances. Second factor involved in a curse of poverty is a curse of poverty brings spiritual powers that block your blessings. So this is, they're, they're connected, but they're kind of different. In the first, it's actively robbing or taking away your money. Now I'm describing something, it is like a, a wall over your, it's like I can never change things. I can never break through. I can never get ahead. Let's look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, first of all. But if you do not obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands and laws, I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and stay. Okay, you can read in your own time. You want a little light reading, read Deuteronomy 28, and it'll talk about all of the curses and all the terrible things that can happen when a curse is at work. However, this is what God says. All right. You will be cursed. And now let's skip down Deuteronomy 28, 23. Here is the description of a cursed person. The sky above will be like bronze and the ground below will be like iron. Okay, that is a classic picture of a curse. The sky above, it's like I'm praying. Bing, it's bouncing. God, this needs a change. I need help. Bing. It's not like, why isn't this changing? Ground below. If you're a farmer, this is it. I'm digging. It's, it's like I'm, it's hard. I can't change it. Those are visible pictures of a curse. You ever talk to people and it's like, man, you won't believe it. I went and they said, you know what, we opened up an old envelope, we found out we never gave you your pay raise, and here's six months back pay, like, what, what am I, chopped liver? Why, how come that never happens to me? And, and then, you know, and grandma died, and I didn't even know that she, she was around, and she gave, I didn't know she liked me, and she sent an inheritance. Why doesn't good things ever happen to you? Is that luck? No. This is talking about something that is supernatural. So if you don't, that's why I'm beginning with this. There are practical ways. Of course, you could break the curse, bind the devil. We'll get into some practicals. You can hurt yourself in other ways. However, we have to start 
here, poverty is a curse. All right, let's look at a second thing and then we'll open for some questions. Let's talk about the entrance of a curse of poverty. So, how do people get cursed with a curse of poverty? Let's begin. Let's talk about generational curses of sin. Sin, according to the Bible, affects families. You make bad decisions. I preach on Wednesday night about how sin will hurt you. Yes, it will do bad things to you. But sin doesn't just hurt you. Sin affects families. There are all sin, if you continue in sin, it'll curse your life. You'll wind up in hell. But I'm talking now about the practical effect here. Sin releases negative spiritual forces. Certain sins release negative spiritual forces and they are transferred. They are passed down in families. Deuteronomy 5 verse 9. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. When God talks about sin and he says, there are certain things you shouldn't do it, it's not because God is in heaven going, naughty, naughty. No, he says this is practical because sin doesn't, that whole thought, this is weird, visiting the iniquity. What does that mean? When people sin against God, especially certain sins, he says, it transfers. There is something supernatural released third and fourth generation. It's at work in families. That quite, I've literally been asked this all over. Do you believe it's possible for families to be cursed because there are people, they've looked around, they're looking at the sickness, the poverty, the tragedy, the divorce, every bad thing, and it's like, how come our family, our next door neighbor's not like that? Because sin is transferable or its effect, its spiritual power. Poverty goes beyond opportunity. I get it. If you're living in the inner city, uh, uh, in the hood, and the schools are are uh, terrible and, you know, there's 50 kids in a class. I, I get that. That's opportunity. I understand that. You know, they don't have a chance to go to college. That's all true. Poverty is learned behavior. You watch your parents make bad decisions. You pick it up. You make... I get that. But I'm talking about something that goes beyond opportunity or learned behavior. It's supernatural. There is something called generational poverty. Some of you, this is what you've experienced. It's not just you. It's not just you struggling. It's not like you, your family are millionaires, and here I am, living in a trailer with tires on top, keep away the tornadoes. No. Many of you, if you look at your siblings, you look at your parents, your grandparents, this is where the whole family battles the same curse of poverty. You struggle in the same ways. Finances are eaten up, unable to break through. That's what we call generational poverty. So for you as a believer, one of the practical ways, and don't freak out about this, we'll give the good news in a minute, but it is possible that sin and disobedience of your family, of your ancestors, has released a curse on you financially. It may be that you are battling something you weren't there. Right? It's one thing if I chose to sin and make bad decisions and curse my life, but what, what according to the Bible, that could be your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, they're involved in things that are affecting you and one of the ways it may be, this is, has nothing to do with salvation. You can be saved, unfortunately, and cursed. That's not what you should be, but it's possible. It's possible that you are on your way to heaven and yet financially right now you are cursed. That's not God's will. We're going to get to the good news. 
But that is, uh, uh, poverty comes through generational curses of sin. Now, as comforting as it may be to be able to blame everything on our family, let's be honest. The second way, why does a curse come upon us? Because of personal sin and disobedience. Let's be honest. Most of us struggle more with our sin and bad decisions that we do with anything the family released in our lives. Now, this can be sin and disobedience before salvation. Please understand something. A curse is not an indicator of salvation. Okay? I just said, you can be saved on your way to heaven... But the Bible tells us about certain, uh, uh, certain sins and certain things you can involve yourself in. Easiest way to understand this, when you chose to involve yourself in those sins, you opened the door. Now at some point you got saved, you prayed. I, I give people this analogy, a curse is an open door. If you are sitting down to eat and you see nasty flies are flying trying to land on your food, you binding them say, I bind you, fly. The door's open, dude. <laughs> right? So this is what people do. You open the door through sin. You prayed. Now you're saved, but you're looking at the nasty horse flies in your life. This is not a vote on your salvation. You're going to heaven. You need to close the door. That's what a curse means. Then, of course, unfortunately, there can be sin and disobedience after salvation. Now, how can this be in our church under my superior ministry? I have no idea. But it's possible that even after we're saved have relationship with God, we can do things that then release a curse. The Old Testament, Achan, he's, he's a Jew. He's part of the family of God in relationship with God. But Achan, Joshua chapter 7, he steals. And when he steals, the children of Israel himself and all of his family were cursed. And that was after being in relationship with God. Look at Malachi 3, verse 9 and 10. You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi chapter 3 is dealing with a specific issue of disobedience. He says, you're cursed with a curse. We just said, how do we know they're cursed? Finances. You can see it in your money. Where did the curse come from? Because you have robbed me. How do we fix it? You need to bring the tithe. So these are God's people who are disobedient financially. They're not tithing. If you are born again, you should tithe. The first 10% of your income belongs to God. It's the, it's the easiest way to show God every time you get paid, whether you agree that he's God and you're not. The 10th is the Lord's. And so he says, there are people, and I've known believers, they had a bill, there was a crisis, it was Christmas, we wanted to go to Disneyland, it was birthday, so they didn't tithe. And I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, I've been pastoring now for over 36 years. I have seen people, and they told me, Pastor, I stopped tithing, and then there was a financial setback, and I started doing the math, and it was to the penny, my tithe. Because God is trying to show you something. You don't get ahead by robbing God. If you're in church, you're lifting your hands, you're praying. If you come to prayer tonight and you're binding the devil, but you're not tithing, you're cursed. You're not going to pray that curse away. 
So it's possible that your sin or disobedience after salvation, of course, after salvation, if you involve yourself in various kinds of sin, then you open the door once again to a curse. The third way that a, a curse of poverty comes is through unrighteous demonic assault. So we're talking about your family, we're talking about you. Those are legal rights. You open the door. There's a knock on the door and there is a burglar. I'm here to steal everything and you open the door. Don't be surprised if things disappear, right? That's, that's a no-brainer. That's family curses or curses that you personally get involved in. However, the devil cheats. You're living right. You're, you are tithing. You're not involved in sin. You broken family curses in the past, but the devil still cheats. He doesn't have the right to rob you, but the devil doesn't care about the rules, right? Is there any robber who says, I would really like to burgle the house, but that's against the law. I can't do that. That would be wrong. That's the devil. He doesn't have the right to steal from you, but he's sure going to try. Job 1, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him. He is an honest and innocent man, honoring God and staying away from evil. Okay, so now we have a principle. We read the aftermath of the devil with all the enemies and the tragedies taking away Job's money. But God says he is an honest and innocent man. That means the devil will try to rob God's people who don't deserve it. They didn't open the door, but the devil's trying to sneak in through the window anyway. John 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The thief, this is actually talking about the devil now. What does the devil do? He's a thief. Doesn't care about the rules. Doesn't, he doesn't care whether you're asking him to. The devil will try to rob God's people even though he has no legal right. And you need to understand that. So, if you are experiencing a curse of poverty, the most natural place is break the curse of generations. We'll talk about that in a moment. Examine your own heart. Are you tithing? Are you involved in sin that would curse your life? That would be easy. But those are yes or no options. Right? What could it be that is cursing my life? Well, sometimes it doesn't have to be a mystery. Right? This is yes or no. Maybe I'm bitter and I don't... It's yes or no. Check, check, check. But if not, this is just from hell. The devil doesn't have the right... But he's trying to steal. Let me throw in one uh, other. I'm not making a full point. In some cases, for most of you, this will be rare. In some cases, there may be deliberate curses put on you by other people. And, and most of you, this won't apply to you. Uh, but some it will. Witchcraft. I pastored in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. It's interesting. You, you know the stories. I, I was on the front lines of witchcraft, meeting witch doctors, and et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting. Many of the curses, witchcraft often involves either trying to get power or trying to have power over people. We call, call that a curse. They put a curse on you. Many of the curses that are, are of witchcraft are aimed at finances. So if you have family members or you work with people or you're in contact with people who are involved in witchcraft, you do need to be aware of that. If you're, if you're experiencing something that is unnatural, you've broken the family curse, you're not cursing your own life, you're praying and, it, and there's still a struggle even though you're uh, fighting the devil off, in some cases it may be that this is a deliberate attack from hell, usually through a person. 
in someone that is trying to rob your finances. Okay, let's open for some questions then. That should give you enough to think about, to chew on, something to ask. No? Boy, am I good or what? <laughs> there was a hand. Who hand? There we go. Up here. At the front, Brian's got to run. I'm helping you get fit, Brian. <laughs> Giving you a microphone. Go ahead. Yeah, Pastor, you said that money is supposed to flow. Uh-huh. But what happens if you don't let it flow? Well, we'll have to leave that for another lesson because that's not today's lesson. But, yeah, we'll, we'll get into the principle of flow. That's a very important. Isaac. So earlier in the, in the lesson, you were talking about uh, like recurring events that happen, and then you talked about opportunities. So is it possible that it doesn't matter how much you're making? I could be making tons of money and yet still be cursed because the money just goes away. Yes, if it's, if it's going away through reversals, tragedies. Yeah. Now, however, what we'll get into next week, poverty is, is how you think. So people who, it doesn't matter how much you make, if you don't think correctly, you'll make bad decisions. So poverty is not an amount. I know people that make huge money, and yet they still live in poverty because they make bad decisions. But what I'm aiming at today is when there are reversal decisions, assault decisions in, in that way. Or uh, effects, rather, not decisions, but effects. I'm sorry, used the wrong word. Somebody else here? Phil Arias. So um, you're talking somewhat about, well, mostly about us taking dominion over uh, maybe a curse that would come upon our lives. Is it possible um, that you can intervene for someone else that maybe... I mean, they don't, maybe, uh, they don't, maybe they don't believe in, the, in this, but you can pray and on their behalf. Try well, to... you, yeah, you can, but really all you can do is pray to God to give them revelation. I don't believe you can break the curse off somebody who doesn't want to break it themselves because it's, it's revelation-based. So I can pray that God will open your eyes. I'm praying for all of you that the lights will go on. You'll go, hey, that's me. But I can't break it for you. And that's, that's the puzzle. Every single person here has the opportunity to be blessed to experience prosperity. Not everyone will. That's on you. Because you have to rise up. All I can do is pray for you for revelation. I can teach you. But you got to get it for yourself. It's like everything else. It has to be personalized. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. My Father in Heaven did. I'm praying for revelation that God will help you. Okay, hold it, Betty. Well, well, I need to make sure I finish and then I'll open again. Let's talk about breaking the curse of poverty now. So let me give you good news. Good news for the cursed is you don't have to stay cursed. All right, if I'm just in, in the first two points, you're going, yep, check, that's me. Yep, that's my family. You don't have to stay that way. Poverty as a supernatural dimension, was taken care of by Jesus on the cross. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is now talking about salvation. This is Jesus hung on a tree. That, of course, is talking about Jesus Christ on the cross. But he says this is very practical in a supernatural way, and that is he redeemed us. That is a Bible word. Ancient times, it was slavery. If you were a slave... The only way out of slavery is you had to be redeemed. Somebody had to buy your freedom. The Bible says the curse is broken. Salvation is supposed to break the curse. 
When you pray and you ask God to forgive you, when you believe on Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, you're forgiven, which means you're never going to be punished for your sin. You don't have to go to hell. But this text says it gets, it's better than that. Why just say, my life is going to be hell, but thank God I don't have to go to hell. That's not salvation. Salvation means, where is the curse at work in your life? Is it in your mind? Is it in your money? Is it in your relationship? You can break the curse because Jesus paid for redemption to set you free. He buys you out of the power. Very interesting. The, the Bible tells us details. It doesn't just say Jesus died, the end. No, it tells us details, right? He was whipped Nails were pounded in his flesh. One of the things the Bible says is they made a crown, a wreath of thorns, and then they put it on his head and they beat it into his scalp. Okay, thorns were the physical manifestation of the curse of sin. In farming, what did God say? your life is going to be harder. In the sweat of your brow, life is going to get harder for a farmer. Now you got to dig out the stinking thorns before you can have anything good. It is not an accident when Jesus died on the cross, he took the outward symbol of financial curse and resistance in our life. And he did that. So I told you about family curses. That may be true. Personal curses may be true. Even witchcraft may be true, and yet I don't care what effect it is, Jesus redeems us. The devil does not have the right. You can close the door because of what Jesus did on the cross. So breaking the curse of poverty, two very important ways. This is, I'm not exhausting this by any means. Number one, you break the curse of poverty by repentance. Repentance. If a curse came because of your own sin or disobedience, what you should do is confess that to God and turn away from it, which is what repentance means. In the Old Testament, it gives all these um, uh, Pictures of what do you do with your sin? So one of these is when you knew that you sinned, thank God we don't live in the Old Testament, is you brought a goat. You, they're going to kill this goat, and as they cut its throat, what did you do? You put your hand on its head while they cut the throat. So it's telling you how serious sin is. It's not a light deal for you to be involved in sin. But more importantly, you are identifying, you are saying, this is me, this is my goat, this is my sin, I did this. That's what repentance means. You don't minimize it, you don't say, well, I had to because you don't know how people treat it. No, I did it, God, it was wrong. So that's how you break a curse. If that's sin before salvation, if you open the door through curse sin, this is not a matter of your salvation now, but you open the door, then break the curse. God, I was involved in things I had no business doing. They're cursed sins, and I am breaking the curse and closing the door. If it is sin and disobedience after salvation, if you have not been tithing, you've been involved in sin in some way, you better fix it by confession and repentance, and then, of course, it doesn't matter what you say if you're not going to change your actions. If you're going to keep on sinning, then no prayer is going to fix that. Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Okay, people who've been stealing, robbing God in the area of tithe, how do you fix it? You tithe. You obey. That's what you should do. The second way you break a curse, you break the curse of poverty by prayer. You should pray to break every 
family curse that may be at work in your life. And then prayer is not just a request. God, I'm asking, would you please help me and give me money? No, prayer sometimes is a fight. When Jesus came up against the devil's power, right, in sickness or, or demon-possessed people, very interesting Bible word is he rebuked. It's a military command. I am commanding you, come out of him, right? It's a command. That's part of prayer. Prayer is not just, oh, God, pretty please, would you give me more money according to thy will? Some of you, I'm, I'm praying while I'm teaching, you should get ticked. You should go, I am getting robbed. This is not normal. So you should rise up in prayer and fight. Part of this is simply internally rejecting poverty in your spirit. Uh, some of you, it's normal. You've lived with poverty your whole life, all your family. There's, I'm praying that God give you revelation. So on the inside, it starts with, you know what? Okay, that's what's happening right now. This is not God's will. I don't have to live in poverty for the rest of my stinking life. Some of you need a stinking life. That's, that's very important to get that. <laughs> and so then in prayer, you fight the powers of hell that are at work through poverty in your life. Gideon, here's six years the enemy has come. Every year, every time they're about to get ahead, the enemy come and they steal. So, the angel of the Lord, this is God in visible form, says, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. And he's like, well, if God is for us, then where's all the... And God says, have I not sent you? You know what the answer is, Gideon? Go fight. And the moment that Gideon is going to go fight, God gives the victory. I, I close with this. I, uh, uh, Tom Payne is one of the pastors in our, our fellowship. And uh, he had told me a story. I've referred to it before. I, I had him uh, tell this story in leadership. And uh, he did a, a lesson on finances. But he's talking about when he first was in the ministry, living in Farmington, New Mexico. He had a, a car that he was wanting to sell and I don't know, buy another car or something. But he said... In those days, there was no Craigslist. There was no online options. It was you had to call the paper, go to the paper and pay and tell them what you wanted to say. So he said every time he would put an ad in the paper or be about to put an ad in the paper to sell this car, something else would break on the car. So now he has to pay money out to fix it, taking more time before he can, and then he would contact the paper and something and he said it kept happening. And he said one day he got sick of it. And he started praying and he cried out to God in prayer. And he recognized, God, not only is this what's happening in this car right now, this is the way it always is. And he said apparently it's not just me, it's other members of his family. There's something at work. And he said, I am sick of it. And he told us how he prayed a very lengthy and detailed. He said, I don't want this curse. So he said he prayed every single thing he could think of under the sun that anybody could possibly do, praying every curse of, uh, of his family, every curse in his own life. And he commanded that spirit to leave his life. And he said his testimony, something fundamentally changed at that moment. Not only was he able to sell the car and move on, but he said... Something lifted off his life to where it was never like that again. Never again was there this constant pattern of struggle and reversal in his life. And he said, from that day when he broke that curse, he said, the blessing of God has been upon his life, on his ministry, on his churches, wherever he might be. So that is something you can do. God doesn't love Tom Paine more than he loves you. You could do that. So that needs to be something in revelation in you. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer right now. Personally, I want you to do that for yourself first. Later on, we'll, we'll pray together. But this is what you have to do if you recognize poverty is spiritual and it's a curse. You need to rise up and break that power. Because if you don't break that power, 
Anything else I'm going to tell you is not going to work. You have to start here, breaking the curse of poverty. We have to stop there. The service will start in a few minutes. God bless you.